Okay, thank you very much, Nia, Julia, and Roger, for a truly fabulous talk and being involved in 3D SIG for many talks. I'm not saying it lightly, really super talk. I'll try to tell you a few things about the dynamic fold space of the membrane proton. Um, I used to be a PI in, in a college up north, and I resigned from there most of the week. I'm at Weizmann, also teach a little bit here, so I got traffic. Uh, um, I got a parking lot inside, um, and I'll tell you some stuff from my uh, postdoc at UPenn, but actually stuff which was just published and which we are continuing to uh, dwell into with Bill DeGrado, who is now in uh, UCSF. So um, despite a short talk, I have to make a one-minute thing which is totally unrelated. On the news between uh, B.B. Berry, um, Berry and No Pants Day in Jerusalem, there was a um, one piece about a guy with no pants, but more serious, about the Tukad Salubel of Victor Shirts that I'm associated with his lab for many years. It was just announced that he got approval for um, a chlorophyll-based um, drug for prostate cancer, which is uh, the biggest drug discovery since Copaxone, and I'm not objective. And it's um, now being um, in clinical trials also for esophagus, breast, and other cancers, and it's a nice story. Uh, it was just uh, published, and if you want more information about that, I'll be happy to tell you later. Um, so I'm doing photosynthesis where we try not to upset the chlorophylls. We work in green rooms, uh, but sometimes the chlorophylls get excited and we just uh, published something on hot electron transfer uh, subgates, which is pretty cool. Um, and being in his lab somehow after becoming friends with an um, ophthalmological surgeon, I, I'm also cutting eyes and uh, butchering rabbits to help people not become blind, and this is another cool story which I will not tell you today. And while some of you would like to hear about prostate cancer and how to get treatment which will minimize side effects such as erectile dysfunction, um, I will move to something else. And um, the logo of the Weizmann is a particle accelerator. And when they try to get money for the particle accelerator, they asked for money for a tube in the ground. Nobody gave money. And then someone has an out-of-the-box idea that you can have the machine putting out the particles under the ground where it won't move, but you can shoot some things up, and you can divide it and do here some hinge, and <coughs> suddenly they got the money. So the bottom line, which is the bottom line of my talk, is that if you understand conformational change, that's key to function, in this case getting money, and new designs which become hallmarks of good places. So when I went to the Weizmann, I thought, well, I'll do something to save humanity, develop some pill, and the membrane proteins are a good target because most of the medications go against them. Uh, but as we heard here from uh, Michael Levitt, um, <coughs> normal modes are very good for experimentalists because they get a notion of what is going on uh, in uh, proteins and what is moving and what is functioning. And it is a simple method, as he put it. Somehow when I um, tried to write a little bit about it, it didn't seem so simple. Um, <coughs> and we got to the stage, according to him, where we can take complex objects such as bananas and see that they fluctuate and they move. And actually, I wanted to go to the Weizmann to every department but plant sciences because I heard that they're, they're doing straight bananas and I'm happy with a curved one. But I ended up working in plant sciences. And the reason is because here you have color. And when we look on all of these, often we cannot look on what is going on inside. And that is something we have to take into account, that if we want to understand what is going on in a knowledge-based conformational change, for example, we need statistics or pigments or some experimental data, but experimental data is often fishy and we need to know what we're looking at. So <coughs> framing my work in green with pigments, I asked what controls functional thermostability in photosynthesis. 
And you can take photosynthesis in mesophiles and in thermophiles, and you can do mutations at sites that you think are important and do saturating mutations and shine light and then look on the fluorescence and look in specific areas within the photosynthetic reaction center and understand what is going on. And if you do it in a water bath, then you can do through Van Hoff plot or Eiling plot, you can also get the enthalpic and entropic contribution of local places by checking the function. So I did that, and while doing that, um, unfortunately, you have to deal with water, and irrigation in Israel is problematic, and somehow I had some drip irrigation, which was invented in Israel, and I drowned this machine, and there are five like that in the world. So suddenly I had time, and I had time to bring my kids to work and to look on the photosynthetic reaction center and teach some photosynthesis. Can I get a little bit darkness? And <clears throat> looking at that, my daughter told me that it looks like chowda cheese. Now, being Dutch, chowda cheese has small holes, not big holes. It's not Swiss cheese, it's chowda cheese. And I thought that that's very nice what she said. Now she's, by the way, a little bit older. Um, <clears throat> and I looked at the system, and as this is just an introduction and it was published, I found out that you have micro cavities inside the protein. So these are the two core subunits that make photosynthesis. Around them you have the special pair accessory for fighting quinones, and the quinone QA to QB is a way determining step of the electron transfer uh, step. And <clears throat> what we did is we did a um, combinatorial mutagenesis at this area, and what happens, to make a long story short, is that electron density comes here, and then it's maneuvered through a cavity here, opens here an H-bond, and you have the electron <coughs> transfer after a transient conformational change. Now, when I try to model rotomers here, they went to an area which I did not understand what is going on. And then I found out that there are here cavities. And actually, Mauserl and Rockefeller in the early 80s found that the volume of the protein by photoacoustics, he found changes in exactly the size of this cavity. And in photosystem one, it changes doubled in photosystem two, and the cavity is double the size. Um, and I'm telling you this because we actually just submitted to plan cell, hopefully they'll get it, a revised version of something that we think we understood gating in uh, photosynthesis. So you have here two key um, transmembrane helices from two different subunits, and those are the two helices which are the closest in all of transmembrane helix-helix interactum. And when you try to do saturating mutagenesis, you have here a point that you can put very few amino acids. As you go up, you can put more. But you have here something that has to open up. And as a mechanism, <coughs> this is what we think is going on. And I'm showing it to you not as photosynthesis, but for me, this is signal transduction. So while everyone looked on the quinones, which are here, and their vicinity, what is actually going on is here at the center of mass of the protein, you have a very important um, inter-subunit H-bond, which enables a movement from one state to another state, moving an H-bond from the quinone and allowing for, um, for this um, uh, electron transfer. Now this, what you have here is, you have here small amino acids. And small amino acids are the number one key to understanding helix helix interactions in the membrane, to understanding dynamic function in the membrane. And the key in it is the backbone carbonyl. The backbone carbonyl is pivotal. The most important sequence motif is G triple X G, where the masking side chains are stripped off and you can have interaction through the backbone, which usually is responsible of the intrahelical um, H bonds, but it has two lone pairs, so you can also participate in interhelical H bonds. And actually, if you are lonely and you want to do the lone pair dance, 
you have to go like this. One, and it's not so easy because one goes up, that's an intrahelical, and one goes to the interhelical, and it's not a aggressive dance, it's a receptive um, dance because those are acceptors. Acceptors to H bonds that in the center of the membrane with a low dielectric constant, you have a isoenergetic but an important component that you can do conformational change and signal transduction. So going from that, I thought, should I look on other proteins and dwell into them and see if I see the same motifs? And this figure is a big PDB file I did with Chris, and now I have uh, Fadi Silfiti and Muhammad Awaisi are doing it as a server, so you can show membrane proteins in a pseudomembrane. And actually, already in 2004, <coughs> I um, went to ISMB and spoke about the centrality of weak interhelical H bonds and membrane protein functional assembly and conformational gating. And I even got the best uh, student award Janet Thornton gave me, but I could never publish this because it went against the, the common belief. Um, but um, amino acids which are involved in H bonding are evolutionary more conserved. Um, you have a lot of glycine in the transmembrane center and in helices which are not transmembrane. Glycine is a helix breaker, no less than proline. You have um, a lot of small amino acids, glycine, alanine, and serine, involved in backbone mediated H bonds, especially in the central part of the uh, membrane. Um, and in the center of part of the membrane at all, you have a lot of backbone mediated H bonds. And maybe above all, one of the known things that was found for membrane versus soluble proteins is that the packing, normalized packing value is very different. And in um, soluble proteins, it is the aliphatic and the hydrophobic amino acids which have high packing. In um, membrane proteins, it's a small one. And the propensity for H bonds and for backbone mediated H bonds is correlated with that. So this is an important feature. And with this in mind, I went to uh, Bill de Grotto and Jeff Saban, who just showed that they succeeded to design a computed helical anti-membrane protein which will monitor and change the activity of integrins. And I thought I will do that in a robust way. So I got a nice grant for one system for cancer, one for psoriasis. And I thought I will be a designer of transmembrane helices, which are essentially like antibodies in the membrane, and they can open a new field. However, since 2007, other than Bill in one example, nobody succeeded to repeat it. And he uh, took actually a uh, helix from Photosystem 1, and he did the regular design. You heard here already too much on design, um, so I won't um, uh, say more. You can never hear too much, but I won't say more. Uh, and he checked it on, on mice, and he saw that indeed he can uh, specifically bind to integrin alpha 2b beta 3, but not to integrin alpha v, although both uh, <coughs> go to uh, the same uh, beta subunit. So thinking of design, and I won't uh, dwell on that too much, I wrote several chapters on computational design. You have a lot of design on soluble things, but as already Sarel showed you, on membrane proteins, you have very little. This integrin example is uh, one of them. And <coughs> for a year, I tried to do this, and I couldn't. And I tried to follow a, um, something that Bill found, that he found that helices, transmembrane helices, fall to very few helix-helix interacting motifs. And the only common feature between the motifs is small amino acids or backbone carbonyls between these uh, helices. So we said that the main problem that we had, we had several challenges. Hmm? Everything's fine. But the main problem was one of search and sampling. We needed a representative data set to do a knowledge-based potential, which is much better, because the set was fine-tuned to what was available and it was not sufficiently representative. So I worked quite a lot on search and sampling and building a non-redundant data set for membrane proteins, which has rules which are very different from the regular soluble uh, proteins. And I looked on two things, a membrane depth 
and on the helix-helix interactum. So as to membrane depth, uh, <coughs> so Sarel alluded already to um, his experimental work. I went from a different direction and I tried to look in an asymmetric knowledge-based potential for positioning membrane-associated structures, which is not only transmembrane, but also lytic um, um, or antimicrobial peptides or things that are on the membrane and assessing the residue-specific energetic contributions. And you have here the different groups of amino acids, the hydrophobic, the small, the um, uh, polar, the charge, the uh, positive inside rule, and the tryptophan and tyrosine, which are the head group, which do the lily pad effect. You can see all of them pretty cool, uh, pretty nicely. And if you go from the C alpha or C beta to the edge of the functional group, you get a much steeper curve between the different sections. A much steeper curve, and you get those big lookup tables where you can put this information. And now you can take a protein, you can put it in the membrane, and you can get the topological pseudo-energy landscape of that protein in the membrane, including whether it's stable or not as to its position in the membrane, which for very big proteins, <coughs> it's usually stable. For small ones, you can actually design lytic and see their differences lytic to um, antimicrobial peptides. So how sensitive is it? So Gunnar von Heine has this EMRE dual topology protein, which can be both like this and like this in two positions. And he does point mutations and he checks how much the percentage of one side versus the other side changes. And by looking on the integral below a uh, specific threshold, we can get with this prediction, which takes a minute, uh, within the experimental data of Gunnar von Heine. So <coughs> mainly the outside part of the um, protein is involved in the transfer, the easy transfer, energy in the Z coordinate, the cross membrane <coughs> coordinate. And you can see that you have the inner part of the membrane where you have a low charge density and on the two sides you have a linear thing going up, but you can split the membrane into two halves, the inner half and the two outer quarters. You can also use that for rotomer optimization, such as snorkeling of a arginine, and you have to do that in a depth-dependent way. So Roland Dundrak with Joanna Slutsky and with Bill DeGrado tried to build a transmembrane rotomer libraries. Other folks tried. It was not successful because you have to take into account the depth dependency and maybe also how close you are to the uh, solvent. So bearing this in mind, um, <coughs> you can design a protein, and this is the recent design of a de novo antiporter of a zinc um, of a four helix bundle that Bill did without me. Uh, Gevorg did here the design of the coiled coil um, following a, a um, two um, ion location from a soluble protein that Bill designed in the past. But the sequence designed for that was using the easy potential. So the easy potential, which gives you the membrane depth, is critical for knowing what amino acid likes to be naturally in what area. And this is context dependent. So for example, a glycine will want to be next to another glycine below it. And if you just put a glycine out there, you, you have to also remember the context dependency. Moving from membrane depth to the helix-helix interactum. There was a um, recent paper that we did, and we are a bunch. I'm, I'm giving here all the list because all of us already left, and we all continued from different places to work on this problem. It was not simple, and I can talk to you here for several hours on the small details of what was done because we, we played here with a lot of things. But the bottom line is that if you look and how two helices interact. So half of the helix-helix interactum in soluble proteins and in membrane proteins geometrically is identical, truly identical. You have anti-parallel two-thirds, you have parallel one-third, you have left-handed two-thirds, and you have right-handed one-third. And this is identical, and you can see here the distance, the angle, and the percentages. 
it's more or less identical between transmembrane and soluble. If you have left-handed, you have the heptide repeat. If you have right-handed, you only have four amino acids to look at. And people are, because two-thirds are left-handed, they treat the right-handed with the same uh, type of heptide repeat as a um, um, left-handed, but you have to treat the two separately. And in design, this is um, important. You have to look also in what we looked is a stretch of 12 amino acids. So you can see here, for example, anti-parallel right-handed, we have close, intermediate, and far. And we have here a distance of 8.16 angstrom between the two normals. And we have the angle and, of course, a plus minus the standard deviation. So now you can characterize the interactum. And characterizing the interactum, you can see different things. The distances are sinusoidal. So here you have one helix and the other helix, and this is for the anti-parallel left close for transmembrane. That's in black. In anti-parallel left, uh, this is intermediate for the soluble. And you can see that the distances, you have here the um, interface positions. That's where there's the, cl the um, closest. Uh, and if you look on soluble proteins, you see that the main uh, factors that holds them together is a hydrophobic effect. At interface fa uh, places, you have higher hydrophobicity. In membrane proteins, despite the fact that they are geometrically superimposable, you don't see it. You don't have the hydrophobic effect. What do you have? So what you have is a propensity for small amino acids. The most common motif is a glycine triplex glycine followed by glycine triplex alanine and overall small triplex small. But this is context dependent. What you have here is small, large, small. Those are the interface positions. Here you have large, small, large. And the idea here is that you put small amino acids so you can connect to the backbone carbonyl as a general feature in a manner that is dependent on the um, specific motif. You can, of course, characterize the, um, uh, <coughs> the interaction pattern and the H bonding and so on. I don't have time to dwell into all these details. One thing which is important is that in the transmembrane um, uh <coughs> proteome, the small amino acids, alanine, glycine, and serine are important in receiving backbone carbonyl H bonds, but the numbers here are not big. You have an average in each, um, in each helix, one such bond, but this is an important bond. So moving from structure into gating, and I'm trying here to do a, a um, um, bird eye uh, review of tools that are meant for the membrane proteome, because people are using soluble chisels to treat membrane proteome and you need a different type of chisel. So this is a toolbox. So in photosynthesis, small amino acids control gating, and especially in a G triplex G-like motif, so glycine, alanine, and serine, which come together, and then you have a isoenergetic move between the two places. You can do this movement or this movement. Those are two different movements. So the helix itself can bend a little bit in some cases, but in most cases, you have between the helices, and then you need two carbonyls that you can flip between the two. And I showed in several examples um, that you can find similar proteins from the same family, and each time a different uh, carbonyl will be materialized as to a H bond. And those small amino acids are pivotal in helix-helix interaction. You have to bear in mind that this depends on the specific um, motifs, the specific cluster, which are all within like 1.25 angstroms. Now, membrane depth, if we go to the basic energy function of all molecular dynamic force fields, you have something called Coulomb law. And Coulomb law has a dielectric constant and the electric constant it's, is nice, but in membrane proteins, and I think this has to change, you have to look on the inner half versus the two outer quarters with a different charge density because it's totally different um, rules applying the two places. Um, and um, 
half of all helix helix interactions fold into distinct motifs. So this was just to summarize so far and just to end up, well, what is this doing? If we are talking about a backbone carbonyl, and if we are saying that that is what's important, let's data mine specifically the backbone and let's look on the backbone. And we can do that in two separate ways. One way is the accessibility to non-intrahelical interactions. So the helix is I to I plus four along the backbone. And if you have a backbone involved in other interactions, you can look on that. And the meaning of that can be kinks. Um, that's something that people looked at. But we'll see that maybe there is a better way to do it. And if I said that those are areas of hinges, we should look on flexibility profiles. Those are two features which are critical in understanding membrane protein conformational functional uh, changes. So <clears throat> in the world of kinks, it's a very kinky world. Because just like in the news, the focus is on the really kinky people. But if you have like a small bit of kinkiness, that's normal, you won't make headlines. And plenty of people looked on kinks and <clears throat> This is one paper where I gave a hand. It's no better or worse on average and whole than others to Jim Bowie, where um, you can predict from a sequence where you have kinks, and this is using a neural network. Um, <coughs> and however, the definition of a kink is that you have to have, and that's how El Weinstein defined and others, you have to have 20 degrees between the two pieces of the helix, and there you have a kink. But if all that you need is just the backbone carbonyl to stick out or to change, you have to look on not the big kinks, which makes headlines, but on the small local distortions, on the small flavors of very local kinks that you will not see at first sight, not on the first date. You have to dwell inside and to see your partner, and only then you'll see the flavors of the small kinks. Okay, so... <clears throat> So let's look on the backbone carbony. Let's search specifically for that. And to find such local distortions, we can do two things. We can look on local 310 kinks. So if you have a H bond that is not I to I plus 4 as a canonical helix, but I to I plus 3, or H bonds which are I to I plus 5, pi bulges. Now, you do have 310 helices and you do have pi helices. But apparently, in many helices, you have a very local distortion where you have a small 310 kink or a pi bulge. And by definition, such a change will expose a backbone carbonyl to enable non intrahelical H bonds. And you can characterize flexibility. So I don't have time to go over all the details here of the mathematics, but I'll just tell you that people have in all the PDB, you have X, Y, Z, and B factor. And people are afraid to look on the B factor because so much side effects are getting into this B factor. You have crystal contacts, and you have large motions, and you have a lot of side effects that contaminate it. So what I decided to do is to look on a subset, which is objectively defined by someone else, of only the transmembrane backbone atoms. And there is a server which is still unpublished. It will soon be published, B Factor Weizmann ACIL, where I look on transmembrane helices, and I look on their B factors, and I get this colorful map. And if I, I have to go also through percent ranking, because otherwise you'll have one um, helix unwinding uh, edge without a proper cap that will get a high B factor. But if I do that, I suddenly get areas where I have a big change, where I have a very high or a very low relative B factor using the normal uh, normalization of B minus the average of B divided by the variance of B. 
only on the subset of backbone atoms in the transmembrane. Using this and Bill's lab, I showed that the M2 proton channel, when there was a big fight between two opposing models, actually has a region of flexible, rigid, flexible, rigid, flexible, which supported the model of Bill, which now is the accepted model and not an opposing model. And <coughs> you can see that very nicely. And here I also added some symmetry. And I also showed it recently in um, the uh, photosystem 2 and bacterial reaction center, mainly photosystem 2. And here in the beginning, you have to capture the photon. So you need a very stable uh, system that will quickly capture the photon. And then slowly you have heat dissipation and you need some uh, loosen up energy, slower electron transfer. And you have here exactly at glycine 208, which is pivotal in the gating, a uh, hinge between the rigid area and an area which goes and become more flexible to support the required conformational change around the quinone. So <coughs> the other part is looking, and with this I'm finishing, is to look on helix geometry. And this is a very, really simple method where I get just geometric analysis. And for example, for the beta-2 adrenergic receptor, I see that methionine 82 is a pi bulge. And methionine 82 is also with a very low B factor. So the B factors which are interesting here are the ones which are at the center, the ones which are either very low or very high. And I like to cross correlate between the two. So now I see that methionine 82 is interesting. Well, is it really interesting? So I go to the literature and two years after the main uh, paper was out, there was a paper in Nature Communications focusing on methionine 82. Now, just for the sake of time, I'm showing here one case study, but I was shocked. And now I'm working simply tediously to go protein after protein. Almost all proteins I looked at in a decent resolution. When I do this simple thing, I find the most important functional <laughs> residues in the protein. And the question is, what is important? Well, I go to the crystal structure nature science paper. They usually discuss like a few residues which are important. Usually with this system, you can find it quite quickly. Sometimes you find things that were not mentioned that maybe are important, uh, but this is a, uh, the way. So I try to show you a toolbox of looking on flexibility, looking on local helix geometry, looking on the helix-helix um, interactum and on the depth dependency and the role of backbone mediated H bonds as things which control uh, backbone um, mediated conformational gating in membrane proteins. I would like to thank the people who are involved in this. Uh, Victor Scherz, it's a Weizmann um, with a molecular biologist and, and a fluorescence expert, Anwar Akaria. Um, and um, this is a ophthalmology, which I didn't talk about in the electron transfer. Um, and uh, UCLA Jim Bowie I mentioned and Bill DeGrado and Jeff Saban. Um, Bill moved from Penn to UCSF together with a bunch of people and uh, Daniel Kulp and Chaim Schremer have moved already. Uh, Gevor Gregorian, I should have put here, he's now in Dartmouth. Dartmouth and um, I have a bunch of uh, students in, um, who do the final project in software engineering with me uh, looking on um, consecutive small amino acid motifs and then continuing to parameterize them and building a few servers which will be a service to the uh, community. So thank you very much. And for the students among you, if you want to look on new challenges in the field, there was a recent uh, review which uh, we wrote uh, with some of the challenges. There are many in the field. And I invite you all to um, Orlando, Florida, although after this meeting, it will be difficult to live up to the meeting there. But we'll have David Shaw, Bruce Donald, Heather Carlson, Shoshana Wodak, Rafi Nachmanovich and a few others which should be published in the upcoming uh, days. Thank you very much. <laughs> Maybe a few questions, if you have any. Okay. <coughs> I'm interested in the B factor profiling. Uh, so does that make uh, the B factor of the two channels are comparable? 
which means you normalize the B vector of one channel and you normalize the what B vector. What do you mean by channel? Uh, from, from the transmembrane protein. Um, how do you define channel? Like two different proteins? Um, um, for example, one protein and uh, they have open <coughs> state and uh, closed state. Okay. And I have crystal structure for both. Okay. But is that comparable yes. with this method? Yes, that's one of the things I'm doing now. And definitely um, looking on similar systems in different states, you can see often things which will be the same between the states. Not always, it also depends on the, um, on the symmetry and the crystallographic uh, conditions. But overall, the idea is to move exactly to that and to look on an um, array of structures and to see whether the uh, outliers, the flexible and rigid points, are maintained among them. And in several cases, I can tell you for sure it does happen. But for example, if the channel opens and it becomes uh, more flexible and the overall B factor increase, after normalized, does that no. information so list? So first, so several things. First of all, um, the overall B factor, from my point of view, is always the same because I put it on the same scale. And if you have a overall increase in B factor, the signal to noise will be not as good. Uh, now, specifically, for example, for a potassium channel, you have there an um, intra subunit and an inter subunit, one in, in the middle and one in the bottom, uh, small triple X, small motifs, which change their H bonding pattern and are critical for opening and closing. Uh, the channel and there is a like, glycine which is a hinge. So all of the motifs that I spoke about here in the potassium channel I can talk for an hour and just show them one by one and you see it in both the open and closed uh, states. Okay, unfortunately we don't have time for other questions so let's thank Elaine. <laughs>